So medical interviews very, very rarely go perfectly and I can guarantee you that if you ask any existing medical student in the UK, they will be able to give you an example of when something in their interview process went even slightly wrong. And this is perfectly normal, of course, because to even get to the interview in the first place, you've already had to invest a significant amount of effort so anxiety is going to be creeping in, tension levels are very high, and all of us have pinned a lot, um, obviously, on this chance of going to medical school. So it's, so it's very understandable that you might flub a line somewhere or do something slightly wrong. But this video and its accompanying article, which you can read online, are going to be focused on basically how to handle these situations when you make mistakes in your medical school interview. Here are some things you can do to try and rectify the situation. So the first example simply might be you flub a line, you say the wrong thing, and again, very, very easy mistake to make in a, in a heated moment. You might not articulate a point correctly, or you might simply put the wrong word in somewhere such that it actually changes the meaning of the sentence, and these things do happen. And if it does happen, there's absolutely nothing wrong with just holding the conversation, backing up a second and said, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with just halting the interview and saying, actually, you know, hang on a second, what I just said was X, um, I don't think I explained myself properly, what I actually meant to say was Y. Fundamentally, if you're not happy with how something sounded when you actually verbalised it, you can fix it, that's absolutely fine. And equally, if the interviewer is feeling nice, they may actively look puzzled um, if what you've said doesn't sound quite right. And if that happens, I think you can fairly safely take that as a cue that you maybe need to have a rethink about how you word the sentence. Second major case is kind of the opposite of this, and that is not talking, not saying anything at all. I think it's the nightmare case for many of us when we go into our medical interviews and it's like, what if I can't think of anything to say and I clam up and I just sit there awkwardly in silence? Now thankfully this didn't happen to me in my interview, but as you can probably tell from all of this stuff, I generally enjoy talking and do so too much. But I do think a good general rule is that talking is better than not talking, because if you're not talking, it's almost impossible for you to be scoring any marks on whatever arbitrary marking scheme the interviewer has in front of them, whereas if you were just spewing a constant stream of words, statistically some of those have to tick some boxes, right? And I think a lot of the anxiety in these situations comes from the idea that there is a perfect answer that the interviewer is looking for, and we could read it off like a script if only we knew what it was, and that just isn't true. And this is a general tip for most medical school interviews. They do not care what you actually say when you're answering the question, because if they're interviewing, you know, 30 people that day, they're all going to be some variation on the same thing. They're not actually interested in your answer. What they are interested in is how you answer the question. Can you do it in a, a logically structured and coherent and well-reasoned way? That's a lot more valuable than trying to word something perfectly. And this is obviously very much true whenever there's a really difficult ethical question. They'll ask you something that seems impossible to answer with no good answer that fits it. That might well be the case, in which case there is no perfect answer, but they're looking for you to be able to logically work your way through the problem. The third case is the mean interviewer, and I think all of us again probably have a story like this. Oh, on station three, my interviewer was so mean, I couldn't get anything out of him, and he just had his eyebrow raised the whole time, wasn't giving anything away. To a certain extent, although it's a shame that this happens, I think this is representative of the real world. Sometimes you are just going to have to suck up and be able to deal with these things. It's not a perfect system. Again, I think the best thing you can do is simply focus on whatever it is you're being asked, and specifically answer that question. And this is going to be one of those times where having thought through the types of questions you might be asked beforehand is going to be really important, because if you kind of start ad-libbing and an interviewer is feeling particularly mean, they may pounce on certain things you say that can be interpreted in multiple ways. So an example of this, and this is actually the one that I enjoy doing to people in my mock interviews with them, is we start talking about the problems in the NHS and if they, they might say something like um, the NHS is becoming more and more bureaucratic and less efficient. So as soon as you get into an area like that, I as the interviewer can turn around and say 
well, if you think it's inefficient, why don't we just privatise the whole thing and then competition will force it into the most efficient state possible, which is obviously a completely hyperbolic um, response. But that often puts people on the back foot because they weren't expecting to be challenged on the minutiae of what they've said. And don't allow yourself to be bullied either. In that case, I am obviously purposefully mischaracterizing something that they've said in order to upset them, um, in that case of the mean interviewer. But if I do something like that, the candidate can perfectly well say, no, that's not what I meant. What I meant was this. And it's perfectly acceptable and you should do that. Don't let an interviewer put words in your mouth. As I said, I think the best way to deal with the mean interviewer situation is to just prepare as thoroughly as you can because that lowers the chance of you being caught off guard, particularly if they might ask you questions about your personal statement, your work experience, any information that they've specified can come up in the interview is absolutely fair game, so you should be preparing to have questions asked about it. Now the next instance is getting flustered, and that's not quite the same as not knowing the answer to something. Um, becoming flustered, what I mean is more just completely losing your train of thought and getting stuck almost in the middle of an answer. You have been speaking, but then you find yourself unable to continue. I think there's only really one way to deal with this situation and that's just asking to take a few seconds to breathe and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. If your typical MMI station might be six, seven, eight, up to ten minutes potentially, the two or three seconds that it takes just to take control of your breathing, get control of your thoughts is really well worth taking in the grand scheme of things. In fact, I would actually argue that demonstrating that you can take control of an awkward situation like that and get everything back within your grasp, that's a really good skill to demonstrate and I think if you can do it properly it might actually impress the interviewer. But the last case I want to talk about is when you actually don't physically know the answer to something and you have no way of attaining it. Statistically, it's gonna happen at some point to some people. You will just be presented a question that you will not know the answer off the cuff, you will not be able to get there through logistical reasoning and the interviewer isn't gonna tell you, so the answer is locked away from you. What can you do? We're gonna break this down, but I think the first thing the most easy thing to do is simply ask them to repeat the question because it could have been that your mind was preoccupied, it was off wandering somewhere else and it might actually snap you back into focus. But the other advantage to doing this is that the fact that you have asked them to repeat it indicates that you might not understand the particular phrasing that they've used which means that they'll potentially repeat the question in a slightly different way. And if they put it to you in a slightly different way, that may also trigger things off in your head that allow you to approach it from another angle or something that you hadn't immediately clicked before. I think another instance where this may be prescient is when you're talking about ethical uh, dilemmas where there may not be an obviously correct answer. Let's say that you've kind of worked through the question, you've come up with some positives and some negatives, let's say it's should tobacco be sold in the UK or something. So you've argued this from both perspectives as equally as you can, but the question asked you to come to a decision. Now, I think it's very tempting in a case like that just to kind of throw your hands in the air and say, well, there are plenty of good reasons on either side, so we can't really come to a conclusion. And in some instances, that may be fine if the question says something like reason for both sides of this argument, but if the question asks you to come to a decision, that's something you actually have to do, otherwise you have not answered the question properly. So what I'd simply recommend you do is, if you come up against this very specific case, is just toss a coin in your head or pick the first one and use that as your final answer, while throwing some reminder in there about obviously there are many important points on either side, ultimately, this is the decision that I'm going to make on this issue, but I am very aware that there are good arguments for the other side. That's a much more complete answer than simply not saying anything. And the last thing I think you can do to help this situation is you can ask to move on, and this is something that I don't think many people realise. But if it, if it was an exam, say, your, your final paper, you come across a question that you don't know the answer to, 
The normal thing you do is give it a skim read, try and maybe jot some points down, but then you move on and you look for a question that you can answer because you're prioritising point scoring. You can do some of the same techniques in your medical school interview. If you are at a complete loss in answering a question, simply ask to move on. The interviewer may not always let you, obviously, if you're at the last question um, in the interview or you need that answer to move on to the next part, um, that may be more difficult, but in most cases, just ask, you know, I'd like to move on to something else, or can I please move on? And they might give you a shot at another question, which will allow you to pick up more points, and that may actually help you if you remember things for later questions, come back and answer that one. So I think that's always a really valuable thing to remember that you can do. But thanks very much for watching, guys. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to go and check out postgradmedic.com where you can also find the online article attached to this video as well as a load of other helpful videos aimed at helping you get through your medical school interviews. Take care and I will see you next time. Bye.